It's uh, 9 o'clock. We're going to get started. I know there's some people that aren't here yet. Uh, I know some of you were out salting last night, and I guess there's some people out still salting this morning. So I guess that's what happens with these type of events. Um, almost always snows during Landscape Ontario, so we're kind of used to that. We have a pretty uh, full agenda for you today. So we're going to try and uh, plug away and get going. There'll be a couple breaks. We're going to have some... Uh, everybody hear me okay? There'll be uh, coffee and muffins. Uh, a little bit later, 10 o'clock, we're going to have a break. Uh, lots of speakers today, but let me just do a few introductions for you first. Uh, first, our leadership team, uh, Rob, Terry, Manny. Uh, they're driving the company in the sales division. Manny is director of sales. Uh, Rob is president and Terry is vice president. You'll find them at the back. Uh, we also have our in-house sales team with Samantha over at the information desk. And Ted is uh, right there. And then for our sales yard, Sarah runs the trade desk. Uh, Jen is over at the trade desk as well today. And Josh, uh, one of our loaders, has been with us all winter. He's uh, here as well. And uh, of course, I'm Brad, and I'm just about always here. Uh, we got uh, the topics that we're doing today are from feedback that we've received from you guys. Uh, we haven't done this in a couple of years due, due to COVID. Uh, we did some surveys. I think there was a survey monkey, and uh, we've asked a lot of people what types of topics they're interested in. So the, the list of topics today has really come from you folks, and that's great. Uh, we want to keep that up. We want to keep doing this, and we want to make sure that we're bringing you relevant information that can help you in your jobs and help you succeed. So there will be some more surveys coming out, and uh, any feedback that you can give us on uh, what you learned today or what you would like to learn in the future would be greatly appreciated. Uh, we have a little contest running today too for those horticulturalists out there. Uh, over by the trade desk there's some plants and there's a plant identification uh, game that uh, Sarah has set up. It's uh, probably a little bit harder than you think. Um, but there will be some prizes for that and we're going to draw that uh, towards the end of the afternoon. So during the lunch break or uh, some of the, the coffee breaks, uh, head over and take a look and see if you can uh, get them right. So I think we can jump right in. And uh, so first off this morning, we're going to have Rob and Ted. Rob is uh, vice president, uh, or sorry, president, uh, 36 year full time. Uh, besides the administration duties, he also looks after the growing and buying of our nursery stock, as well as sourcing uh, plant material from uh, basically all across North America. Uh, and then here we go, Ted has got 35 years of experience in the nursery industry, both in sales and service. He's currently the wholesale sales manager and has been back with the company now over five years. So when you don't find him at work, he's either in the backyard or he's uh, at the end of a fishing pole. So if we can get Rob and uh, Ted to come on up, we're gonna talk about New introductions and some of your favorites. Thanks, Brad. Uh, first off, are we good in the back for sound or do we need more volume yet? You good? And um, we did notice in setting up and didn't have time to adjust that the screen for some of the people in the very back rows might get cut off the top foot, but are you cool? You're good? Yeah? Okay, awesome. Um, welcome to all of you. We'll add uh, Ted and I a welcome, or add our welcome to, uh, to Brad's as well. Uh, some of you know uh, that this series or these seminars started back just before COVID, um, and we're so happy that we could get back to it. We, uh, we were getting great response uh, the year or two prior to COVID, and uh, there was obviously a, uh, a desire for this type of a day. Um, I think in going back to the purpose of the day uh, from where we were three, four years ago, it's really about getting together and being able to say that by the end of the day that you walked away with something that you said, hey, I can come home with that, I can apply that directly to my business, and I can see how that's going to make this business a better place, make it more profitable, et cetera. So our, our purpose in these seminars is for you to really come away with genuine information that you can say, hey, this was valuable. Um, please let us know how we're doing on that, right? So as you get to the end of the day or throughout the course of the day, 
or even uh, in retrospect, uh, once you're back home, please let us know. If there are things that you say, hey, that was you know, less useful, uh, we want to know. If there are things that you say, hey, we'd like to see even more information on that, we want to know. Because this is collectively a learning day. We'll learn a lot from you today, too. Uh, it's a collectively uh, great opportunity just prior to the season where we can say, hey, this was valuable time spent. Um, plants that you're about to see are both new introductions into the industry in the last couple of years, as well as we did spend a little bit of time putting together some slides here that are just key performers that we really think that should stay in you know, most designs. Uh, items that we've seen just always shine in the landscape. You know, and our intention, uh, again, is to keep those in the foreground because if we can keep landscapes successful out there, if, we can, if, if our customers at the end of the day are really happy with how gardens are performing, this propels our industry, All right? So our intention, intention is to try and bring those to the foreground. We've got about 70 slides here. I'll guarantee you there'll be, you know, five or 10 of those that maybe 10 years down the road that we say, hey, we thought it was a better plant than it was. We've done our best to, we really took a lot of time to sort of pull some out. Uh, so we won't get them all right, but I can tell you that the majority of them in here are sort of tried and true, and we know that they're, they're ones that will make our customers happy. So that's it for the gab, and then I'll get into it. Um, we, we have our slides kind of set up behind us, so I hope they always sync up. Ted, do you want to start out? Maybe one more note. Um, not everything that we say will be actually on the slide, so you may want to take notes, but you're also welcome to request the presentation from us uh, once we're done, anytime through the course of the day. We can actually uh, send this exact presentation over to you. Again, it might be worth taking notes regardless or just bullets on some of the items because we've added to the descriptions. Okay, so we got the Thuya Skybound. Uh, some of the other things we like about this, it is an uh, introduction from the prairies, uh, therefore making it wonderfully hardy. Uh, it's got a nice pencil columnar uh, look to it, so if you got a tight area or you just want that unusual look, plant that. Also keeps its color very well for the winter. Next is the North Pole. Uh, there's different series of plants. This one is a proven winner. Um, it, it's got an individual form. Uh, it's a little shorter than the pyramids, um, a lot hardier than the Holmstrup was, so it kind of fits in that genre. Uh, good for hedging as well, um, but, it, but it holds itself well. Uh, better options. Next we have the uh, Thuya Smotlick. This one I like. Uh, it, it's the poor man's version of the chamois cypress once you see it out there in the yard. So as you walk around you'll notice and you'll think, wow, that's a different cypress, but it's actually a cedar. Uh, very hardy, uh, going down to a zone three. So if you want that look, you can push this one in, in areas that are a little risky because generally the cypress are fives, maybe tip into a four. Um, it, it, it's just a less expensive version. Thea Green Giant, um, it is a Western cedar uh, derivative, so placata type. So we were a little concerned about when we brought it in about hardiness, but it's, uh, it's proven to be super tough. Um, it withstands or, or uh, it seems to be a bit more deer resistant uh, from deers eating it. Uh, which is a big thing for some cedars, especially if you're planting next to forest areas. And it is so fast. It's super fast. If you're looking for, you know, hey, customers looking for a quick cedar hedge, and that seems to be the, the highest priority for them is fast, then think about this green giant. A um, little bit more of an ornamental, this Pinus strobus stow pillar, uh, just a real stately plant. Um, it, it is meant to be used essentially as an individual or maybe a group of three, uh, but very, very stately in terms of the form. Uh, it's not supposed to split apart, and so far it's holding up in heavy snows, uh, so it does have a strong enough stem that they don't fall apart like some of the uh, strobus might because of the softer stem. Um, and the growth rate, although it'll grow fast enough for you, it stays 
compact as it does, and uh, it is a tree that's expected to be a 100-year-plus tree, so it's one that will also make sure you plant it in a place that you expect to keep it for a lot of years. Hillside creeper, uh, which is a Scots pine derivative. Um, I've seen this plant, uh, I'm going to say at least 15 feet wide, and it's still only maybe a foot and a half in height, two feet in height. Uh, and it, it doesn't get dead sections in it. You don't see too much wood, so just enough so there's a bit of character, but it really fills in nicely as a thick carpet. Tried and true. This one, it's uh, highly overdue to make a comeback. Uh, Taxus cuspidata nana. About 20 years ago, you couldn't keep these in stock, and it kind of went by the wayside. This plant does well in a lot of areas, especially if you got low light. Uh, takes very well to pruning, can use as a hedge, as an individual specimen. Um, yeah, old school, new school, right? And that's where you're going to see some of these slides. You're going to say, like, this isn't new, but it's, it's time we bring some back. I'll jump in on this one, um, only because... Uh, there's a little bit of a story behind it. So Lakotho Rainbow, it's been around for years, um, but hardly ever used. Uh, it's really an understory plant that's um, in the broadleaf um, category um, that has some fantastic color, rainbow especially, has a real nice mix of pinks, whites, etc. cetera. Um, and again, long thought of as not being really a super hardy plant, but we're finding that's not the case if it's in the right area. If you're in a, a well-drained, uh, acidic, maybe understory setting. So if you're in a little bit of a higher elevation uh, in sandy soils and, and, you know, a little bit out of the wind, then you'll do just fine with this plant. And um, you'll notice the inset beside the white pickup truck. That was actually taken about four weeks ago. Uh, it is in North Carolina, uh, but that's kind of where the plant matures to, about four or five feet. And that is in the dead of the winter, so that's not even anywhere as near attractive. Um, the top there is pretty much in the top shot what that plant looks like most of the season with any new growth. So it's got that nice pink variegation. Uh, the rotos, many, many rotos. Uh, this is one of our particular favorites. Um, the picture speaks for itself generally. Uh, there's other varieties of the PGM, um, but, but this one specifically has the, that very intense color. It's got the mahogany leaf to it. Uh, it does hold its leaves in the winter, so a, a good all-purpose plant that you can use in your gardens. And like I said, explore them because there are other varieties that we carry. Uh, Asa Rubrum, Frank Jr., it's a Schmidt introduction. Uh, now Schmidt is one of the foremost growers and introduction companies of new trees. And they, they put out a really nice product, and generally when they say something, it, it can be taken for truth because there's no, they've, they've done their homework. They're, they're really good. This one here I like because it maintains its good form, um, and, and it's a really good option in a survey type situation to use instead of a native red maple, right? So we're going to talk later this afternoon about natives, right? And, and it, some of them need help, right? So this here is a good option for that to give you that look. Okay, this is the uh, Parkland Pillar. We're going to show you quite a few slides coming up of pyramidal trees. As all the yards get smaller, uh, people want instant privacy. There's tons and tons of options out there. This is one of them. It's a Canadian introduction, which makes it super hardy. Yes, it is a birch, but it does not get the bores. It doesn't get the problems. Um, it has a tighter branching, so it, it holds well in the winter. So when you get the ice, the snow loads and all that, and today's a good example, right? We could have had lots, but we've been spared. Uh, it's, a, it's a derivative from uh, a variety called the Dakota Pinnacle. Uh, ginkgo blagon, or gold spire ginkgo, um, that picture in the fall is no exaggeration. I've got one in my own backyard, uh, and it does get that intense. Um, nice thing about that one is that it grows tight on its own, so just a little bit of behavioral type pruning will keep it in that shape. Um, slow, maybe even slower than the average ginkgo, and ginkgo can be, you know, it's one of those 
thousand year trees and they really do build, they actually do get that old and older uh, so it's it's slow but uh, every year it's just kind of appreciates more right so um, it's definitely one that would be well suited for uh, driveway markings uh, is where I've seen them used you know where there's maybe a row of you know three to five to six plants um, and uh, and really no issues that we know of in terms of disease Grindstones, one that's maybe a little newer. We don't know as much about it other than the uh, the founder of this tree, uh, a company called Hale and Hines out of Tennessee, is super excited about it um, because he's seeing really good things in the performance in the field. Uh, it has been out long enough that you can see a mature shot here. So we know enough about it to know that it's strong enough. Um, it, it can also be started from the ground up, so you can still get that same look as Blagon, and it's supposed to be a little bit faster. Okay, so the speed, if speed is an issue, I just, I don't think it's going to be quite as contained. So if you need something that stays super tight uh, in that, you know, six foot and under range, use the Gold Spire Blag on. If you want something that does get a bit more size to it, then I think this grindstone would be a great choice. And I'll give you one more here, the um, Liquid Ember Slender Silhouette, which I'm sure a lot of you already know. Um, Slender Silhouette, we just thought it was worth noting because... Again, we do have to watch a little bit where we're using this one. Um, it's not going to take the wide open fields the way it should. Uh, but most areas here uh, that are urban, uh, or especially obviously anything that's surrounding lakes, uh, it'll do just fine in. And you can't beat this thing for the multicolor. Uh, we didn't get the shot with that, but it's a real mix of red, yellow, and orange. And I don't know anything that's as spectacular in terms of color in the fall. And uh, from a behavioral standpoint, again, it's, yeah, I, I don't know that I've seen them much wider than maybe eight or 10 feet, so they really do stay nice and tight. Yeah, and the leaf also, it's, it's a little shinier than that and a little darker green in color, so pardon our picture. Uh, Liriodendron tulipifera. This is a, an offshoot of the native Liriodendron, so it has the maple leaf look. A uh, nice thing about this, it, should get the flower as well. Now, if you have never seen the flower of the tulip tree, I suggest you take a look online and go to the Google Monster because it is fantastic. It's like almost virtually impossible to think that a plant can flower so nicely. Uh, the leaf is what's cool about it as well. And on this plant, don't be afraid to prune it. Like a lot of people are afraid to prune some of these pyramids, right? But you want to keep them tight so that they can withstand anything that's thrown at them. Uh, next is the populace. Yes, we are showing you a poplar. Um, it has its purpose. It has its reasons why. Um, this one here, very hardy. Doesn't mind to have a little bit of a wettish foot, right? So if you, you got an area that you think might be a little too wet for an oak or something where it's going to rot the roots all the time, this one will be a little more forgiving. Uh, the stems are also very good on it. Uh, and it has a nice milky white bark to it as well, which gives it a birch-like effect without using the birch. Uh, Platinus, it's a very unusual plant. It has almost like a camouflage bark to it. Uh, sometimes it will look like it's defoliating, so it, it's not always about the leaf, not always about the stems. It's the uniqueness of everything. So if, if you're looking for somebody that's got a big open spot and they want a tree that's going to take whatever you're going to throw at it, I find these are good. Uh, this one here, the, it goes all the way down the ground, but generally you buy these, they're, they're actually a shade tree. We just thought this was kind of neat just to show you, you know, what you can do with these sometimes if you can get them with the lower branching. Um, yeah, maple-like leaf, unique bark, very good plant. All right, uh, Kindred Spirit Oak, fairly recent introduction, uh, and really just noted for uh, the smaller format. Again, on this, it does stay pretty tight by comparison to some of the traditional pyramid oaks. Um, so one of the shorter columnars, uh, dark green leaves on these. Uh, they do have a, a bit of a lighter green um, underleaf as well for contrast. Um, I'd say when it comes to mildews, which oaks, pyramidal oaks in particular, can get, it seems to be a lot cleaner on that regard as well. I think the old Rover Fastigiata, we could see 
mildew, sometimes scales, etc. Uh, this one definitely stays a little cleaner. And along the same lines, uh, a little bit more vigorous and uh, ultimately faster and taller variety, but the Regal Prince um, is a great choice. I mean, we, we actually weren't going to carry the tree, um, and it just kept performing in production. And we said, boy, how can we get rid of that thing? Because it's just, you know, we're always trying to sort of narrow down the amount of varieties that we carry because there's just so many introductions. So we're always actually on the lookout for things that we can kick out is really where we're at. Um, because you, you just, we don't need 14 varieties of Pyramid Oaks. Right, so this was actually on the on the chopping list more than anything else a few years ago where we said, no, we just we don't think that we are seeing the properties in it. But this thing just keeps excelling. And I think the thing that probably makes it most unique besides it being fast is the fact that it has that real contrast um, in the underleaf. And it's almost kind of a silver. Uh, so is that and the speed. Um, I'll let Ted start with the flowering shrub category here. Jap oh, no, didn't work. There we go. Sorry. Um, Japanese maples. They can be your friend or they can be your enemy. This one is going to be your buddy. Um, everybody knows uh, the hardiness of the blood good. This one is with it there, but this is a nice pyramidal version of it. Uh, so again, you know, the yards are getting smaller or you just want a nice specimen to stand out on its own that's not gonna take over the whole yard. Uh, the Trombus Red Sentinel. I like this as well because if you, if you take a closer look at it, you can see it's got a nice layered look to it and it is one of the only pyramidal ones out there. I'm gonna phrase a term from an old designer. It's a standalone specimen. And everybody in the business knows who that is. This here is probably one of my favorite ones. Uh, hoping to put one in my yard this year. Uh, I've planted this plant in both windy conditions, shade conditions, uh, protected. It doesn't matter. This plant will grow and it will perform for you and do what it's supposed to. Uh, nice color on the branches, but it's a very unique orange. It's got that deep, elongated leaf to give it almost like the cut leaf effect of, uh, of, of a, an abishadere or something like that, just a little bit bigger. Um, it's just probably one of the uniquest maples as far as color goes of all the Japanese maples, unless you go into like the butterflies and that, which have the, the variegated leaf and the pink, um, but preference. Like I said this is my favorite. It's a good, good plant. Uh, here's another proven winner. Uh, we all know the corn sericea, which is a native plant. Uh, this here is a good option for an offshoot. If you're not looking for something, it's going to get really high. Uh, stays nice and tight. Uh, the coloring of it in the winter is really good as well. It's red all year. But as the temperature gets colder, the red gets drawn out a little more vibrant in it. Um, Low maintenance, you know, and it's got other cousins too that are a little bit smaller, like the Ghent, but Izali, stuff like that. So thousands of varieties, not thousands, but lots of varieties of dogwoods. So don't hesitate to call or ask if you have any questions on the dogwoods. So Winecraft Black, um, we love Royal Purple Smokebush. Uh, this one is the darker version, foliage-wise, and probably the biggest advantage of this one would be in that it grows shorter. So it stays quite a bit more compact. Uh, what is the maturity height we've got on this one? They're saying only six feet. I don't know, to be honest, I don't, I don't know. I haven't seen one that's any bigger than that at this point. They could get a little larger, but they definitely have a more compact branching habit in the way that they grow. So it's definitely going to stay shorter than the Royal Purple, which could have gotten, in some cases, we've seen them up to 20 feet, right? So if you like the texture and the look of the royal purple I'd say and you're concerned about size and space this is the one Winecraft black um, another one that we've been using deer villa for a lot of years as a native plant uh, which I'm sure Ted will talk about later today uh, like the Lanisera and it's a great mass plant this one here is a break off that uh, blooming easy has come up with and um, blooming easy um, loves this one and, and so do we in the last few years because it gets the maroon 
It goes from green to maroon coloring on the foliage that lasts all season. So any of the new growth uh, will always have contrast. And then you're still getting a good flower on it. In fact, the flower is stronger, I think, than even the Lanistra, than the native selection. Um, another thing about Deer Villa is that it does attract uh, birds and bees. Uh, and I would say that it is low maintenance. Um, we skipped Euonymus. There we go. Okay. Unforgettable fire. Um, so we've been using burning bush for years. This one has definitely a more intense red. Um, so you will see, uh, as if we're not already intense enough, but you'll see a really, really bright coloring on this one. And they finish off with kind of a nice pink finish as well. Um, one of the things to maybe note about burning bush in general, and I know it's on some of the invasive lists, okay, but one of the things to note about burning bush is that there is nowhere in the world, according to all of the breeders of Euonymus alata types, that the color is as strong as it is in southern Ontario. So it's just a little unique thing for our area. Um, we, we have some of the strongest fall colors in the world, but this plant just absolutely shines. I was... Uh, amused by a story that the guys in the Netherlands told me about burning bush. They said, well, yeah, you know, we don't like them around here because they don't do much. They, they color up a little bit, but that's about it. Uh, in our area here, they said, if we want to see good color, we come to Ontario. <coughs> so it might be, might be one we want to keep using. Um, hydrangea bobo, which is another PW. Um, we resisted PWs a little bit in the in the beginning, but you know they're doing a ton of good work. Those folks on just finding good selections, and not all of them have been winners, right? But they but they have found some really great selections that we're all using now, you know. And um, we like to promote that because again, they're successful plants. You know, they're plants that are performing that our customers are definitely happy with, and that's why we've included a good number in this in this uh, series of slides. Um, Bobo is everything the hydrangeas are, but again, stays more compact. So compact is definitely something that we can uh, all appreciate. Uh, three to four feet is basically the size. Um, Firelight is another one that we want to talk about. I don't know how the slides keep going. You are a long ways ahead. You're going to go back one more. Back one more. There we go. Okay. So Firelight. Um, I, th I think our catalog right now has about 20 varieties of hydrangea paniculata. Um, what we're trying to do is we're trying to make sure that we're always kicking a couple out while we're introducing a couple of new ones. The reason why this one's on the palette is because it has a very unique dark pink uh, bloom. And when they finish off, they're even darker. They're almost, I'd say they're away from pink and almost red so dark. Uh, so it makes it exceptional uh, by comparison to a lot of the hydrangeas that are out there, and Ted will talk about a couple of the others. Okay, so this is another proven winner. Uh, proven winners, you're going to have your, cu your customers ask, like, can I get this one? Can I use that one? Can I use this one? Because they're going on to the Google to see what's new and what's out there. Uh, rest assured, when we introduce one here at Conan's, we have proven it to work in Ontario. Um, if you're here before you heard me say it, I, I think Ontario has the harshest fluctuations in temperatures in, on, in Canada. You know, it can be cold one day and 30 degrees the next day, uh, especially if you're out in Windsor, uh, Chatham, Leamington, like that's the subtropics of Ontario. So we like to prove them here and make sure they're going to work here before we introduce them to you. So rest assured, you might not get something your customer wants. We'll have something close because the options are there. Uh, this one here we like as well because, again, the changing colors of, of the flower head from the white to the different changes, there's always something to look forward to. Um, sure. It's, it's a shorter variety as well again, you know, so you could use this in the foreground with lots of other options in the background, okay? So don't, don't be afraid to mass plant this one. Use it as a hedge even if you have to. Uh, think outside the box when you're using some of these new ones. Uh, this was one of the original ones I remember. We've had this one for a long time. This is a taller version of them all. Um, this color is very bold. 
especially as it changes and gets to that final stage uh, that you're looking at. It's got a unique strawberry pink color to it. So again, right, it, it's not just that it flowers white or flowers pink, it, it, it's an ever evolving process. Um, you know, and, and, and people now are using these new hydrangeas as cut flowers, right, in, in their gardens or when they're outside on their patio, what nice to have something sitting there when you have company over. So, you know, cut them, use them. There's so many uses for it. Uh, Physocarpus, yes. You know, I wrote a little joke on here. I like it. Don't tell my minister. I like the little devil. Okay. Um, Physocarpus can sometimes tend to get rather unruly, uh, especially the native varieties. This one tends to stay a little bit tighter. It's a durable plant. Uh, it doesn't get the, the, the fungus that, that they're known for as well. Um, it's a good substitution for a prunus sestina. Okay, because we, we overuse certain plants and by using them all the time, everybody thinks they're native and, and stuff like that. So it's, it's good to introduce some of these new varieties, right? So it's something different in the neighborhood. Um, but yeah, good option for the sestinas and another good option for a hedge. Uh, Ruis Grolo. So this picture here, I love this picture when Alana found it for us because we underuse and undervalue, I think, sometimes the Ruis or sumac, right? Just because of its name and we're so used to thinking that the, the sumac is just this big massive plant that grows out in the woods, takes over your whole yard. My personal, this Grolo, which is the red one here on the bottom, you're not going to get a more vibrant fall color than that. When that changes, it's, it, it's blinding, right? The sun beats off that shiny leaf. You got this red coming back at you. It's phenomenal, right? And it, it's good for um, ground cover. It's good on a commercial property setting, right? So don't be afraid to use it. Takes well to pruning. So if you put one or two in, in, a, in a residential planting or three, don't be afraid to prune them right the plants like it and like any plant they need to be pruned they need to be kept healthy and you're going to do that by keeping them pruned keeping them smaller but give them room to grow so we're highlighting the grow low but if you look in the back you see the orange there that is the bale tiger okay another one um, it doesn't get as tall and as invasive as the the ruis typhina give it room though because they do get a little bit large and then the yellow one here in the corner is the Ruiz glabra. So many options. Uh, some of them can be hard to find. The glabra would be one of them. Uh, years ago it was very popular, but as these plants die out in fame, so do the amount of growers that, that want to produce the plant. I'll talk about the uh, Iceberg Alley. Um, we had that one in production for a couple of years before we introduced it really because we weren't sure how it was performing but um, I think it's here to stay because it's got a very unique foliage it's uh, as you can see in the picture it's almost lavender like you know and um, the plant itself will nicely maintain no more than about three feet uh, probably spread out comfortably to a good four or five uh, from what we can tell and um, just hardy being a salix and and the unique foliage on it again it's not like if you use salix purpurea and nana um it's always been unique in the bluish gray color but now this one's actually got a bit of a fuzzy furry consistency to it too so it really gives you that silver um this pearl potion syringa another blooming easy um that we're bringing to your attention because we all use a ton of syringa meri palavin or dwarf lilac um, over the years we have and this is a white version of that um, from what we can tell again a pretty strong grower so I think we've now got one that we can say hey if you're looking for a dwarf lilac it doesn't always have to be a lilac color um, the scent is still pretty good was another note that we wrote on here uh, so it, it still has a pretty good fragrance and then viburnum cassanoides little ditty uh, another proven winners so Cassanoides is a native plant, um, and 
we haven't even really used that one a lot yet. It's becoming super popular uh, because it is a pretty well-behaved plant, the cassinoides. Um, and they're already coming out with derivatives of it. The nice thing about this one, again, is it's just a compact version of that. But what we've also found is that it just flowers a lot stronger. It flowers, uh, I'd say, 10 times stronger than the actual natives. So um, good one to use. Even as a pollinator, uh, there's another note on that, and that's that it has a fairly noticeable bluish gr uh, black fruit as you get into the fall. So that shows up nicely, too. And I'm going to give you uh, just the introduction to Wygelia here. We've shown a few pictures of Wygelia um, in the preceding slides. I think there's about four or five of them. And really, it's because of the fact that what's happening with Wygelia is that it's always been a great you know, landscape staple, but what's happening in the last few years is that we're getting varieties now that have repeat bloom ability, right? So we're getting varieties that will actually flower right through the season. We're also getting better foliage varieties, right? So um, we talked about maybe the idea of substitute for uh, Prunicistina or Purple Leaf Sand Cherry. Well, this, the Wygelia varieties now, you can get them that they come up nicely to say three, four feet. They're a lot more well behaved. They last a lot longer and they have a much better foliage, you know, especially than the old varieties of Wygelia. Now they're into real dark, glossy and black foliages, etc. So the first one I'm showing here is the spilled wine. Um, pretty good in terms of the purple foliage that lasts all year, but the flower is just incredible on this one. Uh, it is still uh, a plant that has sort of a more one-time bloom capability. Ted will talk about a couple of those that flower all season, but this one's sort of a one-time bloom capability, but the foliage makes up for that. It's, it's colorful all year. <coughs> all right, peach kisses. Uh, like Rob said, to finish that off, a lot of these new varieties, we find the colors are more vibrant, um, not just your, your basic red, purple, white. Um, so th there's interesting as a palette that you're going to use in your designs. And you get people that want something unusual. This Peach Kisses is one of those. Now with these new varieties, we like them as well because they, they, they stay nice and tight, nice and compact. You know, and again, a lot of these slides, like we show, they're geared for the smaller yards, right? The day of the half acre, acre yards are, are finished. The, the, the municipalities want to pack as many houses on there to get their taxes. So it's our job to make sure that that plant and that yard looks great. So by using some of these new ones, we can do that with your flowering shrubs too on some of the varieties and then what Julia tends to do that as well even if they are a, a repeat bloomer it doesn't hurt to give them a little bit of a haircut after that first initial flower is there because it'll promote the new growth faster and with the new growth will come more flowers uh, date night strobe uh, there's a few of the date nights uh, we're showing the electric love um, nice red flower dark foliage again uh, there's not a lot of tried and true dark foliage plants. Uh, so he here's a good one for that. The leaf structure is good. Uh, and remember your, your Wigilias and all that, they have good fall color as well. It's either a different shade of dark or, or red or yellow in, in the purples and all that. Uh, wisteria. Uh, we do not show a lot of vines on these slides. Uh, there are very many options out there. Uh, we still like uh, the, the Floribunda Blue Moon. Uh, it's one that flowers a lot earlier than the old style of wisteria. Uh, people don't have patience now. They want flowers. They want it now. Um, they're very hardy, uh, this variety, as well as the next one, the Amethyst Fall. Sorry, it's probably my big fingers. Um, they, they serve multi-purposes. You can even use them as like a divider if you have a, a fence or a tall fence and you want something to just grow like crazy. Use your wisterias. Uh, it, it's another option to keep your neighbors at bay, to keep that privacy without taking three, four feet of your yard. Um, so if you just want to use it as that. Uh, we find with the wisterias sometimes they like to grow, 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 and they don't like to flower. That's because we're probably giving them too much kindness. Um, if you find your wisteria is not blooming, beat the living daylights out of the root system. 
stress that plant out, okay? Don't be afraid to hack it back. Don't be afraid to disturb the roots. By doing that, you're gonna force the plant to flower the next season. Uh, this one has a multicolor. It, it's got more leaves too. So, you know, some of the, one wisteria might have like seven to 10 leaves. This one has 10 to 12 leaves. Um, let's talk a little bit about roses. Um, the old categories being, say, the hybrid teas and floribundas, climbers, etc., they still have their place, but they are definitely a higher maintenance category. Um, and the old categories, I think in a lot of ways, um, people were disappointed with the success rate. Uh, we, we lost so many as an industry, you know, 15, 20 years ago in some of those categories that people kind of got away from roses a bit. Please start reintroducing them because there's some fantastic stuff coming up the pipeline. Uh, and a lot of them are derivatives of shrub types, um, and they're really based on, again, multi-flowering or all-season flowering capability uh, with, with real hardy tendencies uh, and low maintenance. Uh, things like, you know, the, the scab and so on that we used to get in roses, et cetera, you hardly see that on some of the new varieties now. So a um, couple introductions. The Ringo, which is, we call it a landscape rose category. It, it is a PW. Uh, again, great disease resistance and reblooming for most of the season. Uh, the next one being at last, um, noted for flowering first thing in the spring, right through till frost. Um, at this point, it's an orange color. If you can't use orange, then it's a bit limited in terms of the actual colors available yet. And I'm sure there'll be others coming out in the series, but at last, uh, also great fragrance and. Peach lemonade. Uh, I just love the multi-color in the full or in the flower, um, and they start pink and finish white, or is it the other way around? I think they, yeah, fade to white and blush pink. Um, starts yellow, um, but there's enough overlap time that you actually get them flowering with about three different flower colors while they're flowering on the bush for, I'd say, multiple weeks. Right, so you're really getting a real strong contrast between all the different colors. Again, good disease resistance, uh, and it is considered an all-season bloomer. And I want to kick you off in the next category here. Um, we're moving through them, I guess, uh, just about on schedule here, so should have you under the hour. Um, but the next category is, if we're looking for more columnar forms in the landscape, which we are, um, if we're looking for stuff that stays tighter, there's a real resurgence back to upright evergreens. Um, and I mean, they're perfect. They're, they're cigars, they're, they're there all season long. Um, you know, there's been an awful lot of introduction on deciduous trees in the last 10, 15 years. Um, but there's, as I say, a real resurgence back to upright evergreens as well because of the fact that Really about the only thing that they're, they're rock hard tough, but the only thing that you need to be a little bit concerned about is that they can, they can sometimes get uh, some of the common airborne viruses in them that need to be uh, watched for. And if they are, and if you get things like cedar apple rust or just scabs or whatever it might be that can get into junipers in particular, um, it's really just a matter of watching out for them. And if they, you know, if, if you do see some of it that we either pruned it out or that we make sure that we're, you know, appropriately, um, applying for them in advance with things like dormant oils, et cetera. But, but really from a maintenance standpoint, generally stay pretty clean all on their own if they're healthy. Um, and uh, the, the varieties that are coming out now and the colors and the, and the, and the uniform and slender form in them is fantastic. So <coughs> as a category, I really think we should be using more of them again. Uh, and a couple of the ones that we've illustrated here, I'll just get it started off as the blue arrow, which does tend to stay uh, within about four feet, even at tall sizes, uh, and the Medora at three feet as, uh, as an overall width. Uh, those are plants that are going up to about 10 to 12 feet. So yeah, as Rob said, we're back. Um, I agree with him. It, it, you know, we, we, again, we're looking for different options, and, and not everybody can afford your Cupressinas and your Isili Fastigiatas, and, and these plants died off for a while, it's about time they come back because they take well to pruning, they take well to manipulation. So you can do what you want, 
But remember, if you get them small, don't pack them tight to start. They're going to grow, okay? And, and conifers do like to grow, especially the junipers. Uh, don't be afraid to prune them, but realistically, make sure you give it some room. Uh, Fairview is a, a nice green version, um, salt-resistant, fast grower. Um, the Spartan, it's good in uh, urban city areas. Again, doesn't mind the pollution, doesn't mind the heat. Right? And that's the nice thing about the junipers is they don't mind the heat. And once they are established, they don't need a ton of water. Um, these next one here, the, the Taylor, I'm really excited about that one because everybody says to you, I want that European look and I want those tall cypresses that you see in the Europe landscapes. This is the Ontario version of that. Uh, I have used it myself in designs and, and it stands up fantastic, but it only gets about three, four feet wide with very, very little pruning. So again, tight yards, you wanna put a collage of three. Um, it makes a really good statement. Uh, Hill Spire is another one, very tight growth, uh, pyramidal, uh, deer resistant, right? And that's the thing too, some of these you know, as, as we start to take away more and more native land, the rabbits, the deers, and all these creatures like to come into town. And trust me, they come in in the middle of the night and they'll eat your garden blind, right? But the junipers tend to be a little bit better for that. Uh, Iowa, oh, come on. The uh, Iowa is another one. Um, this one seems to have, and, and the Kettleri as well, they seem to have a little more... Um, open stance to them so again it's a nice um, art piece if you want to say because it, it doesn't necessarily grow in the perfect pyramid or the perfect wide uh, you'll find that this plant will shoot a branch off here just just to give you a different look uh, Dutsia yuki uh, both cherry blossom and snowflake uh, just really noted for their tight form and uh, good fall foliage color, they go to a burgundy, um, and then the flower is, is really showy. Uh, fairly short-lived, but really showy if you're just looking for something that has a real punch in the spring. Um, the snowflake being the white, the cherry blossom being a pink. Um, I want to talk about the buddleias. Uh, buddleia used to be kind of a well, nobody's got room to plant one word. Um, now there's there's a number of different series that have come out in the last few years that are both profuse and bloom as well as uh, they have um, a real tight habit to the plant. And so just special note on these, the pugster is that the flower itself is incredibly large for the size of the plant. They're a dwarf plant, but a real large flower. And then uh, the lava lamp series, hydrangea, we're kind of bouncing back towards a couple of that we missed in the first part, uh, just because these have been around for a couple of years, so these are a little bit more of those plants that are still worth mentioning, that we increase the use of them, if at all possible. Uh, the Lava Lamp series, um, I'd say the Flare is probably the brightest one that you're seeing in the red. The Moon Rock has large blooms uh, with a strong lime green center, and the Candelabra seems to be the most fragrant of them in that series, but they, they are definitely all worth noting. They have special characteristics over and above some of the ones that we already have. And then I, we, I alluded to the fact that we had more Wygelias. I just want to highlight this one, and that's the Sonic Bloom series. These are actually the repeater Wygelias. So these Sonic Bloom, um, I've seen them repeat their flower three times in the same season. Um, also noted for attracting hummingbirds. And uh, just a note about Hypericum. Um, so if there's a slide in the set that we would say is not necessarily suited for everyone, it's going to be these. Um, it is uh, technically a, a zone 6 plant, maybe even leaning to 6A, 6B. So there are some zones, micro zones around here that they would work in naturally, but if you're going to use these, just be real careful where you use them. The, the nice thing about them and the reason that we still included it is because like a perennial, um, you know, you, you still get maybe a couple of seasons of use out of them and they m might even be considered throwaway. But these things have incredible f uh, fruit on them. And the fruit 
is not like anything else. So it's just uh, it's it's a nice contrast to the, in the landscape in the fall season. Um, I guess the question would be: Is there anything wrong with looking at some of these plants as basically just an in-season plant, like we do an annual? You know, use them for a couple of years, and if they do happen to die out, we replace them. Right? This would be one of those types of plants. Yes. Great. Yeah. Well, thanks a ton for that input because, yeah, we, uh, you should be the testing grounds for everything. <laughs> no, maybe that's where we find out, right? We find out from our customers and, uh, you know, what are they having success with? What are they not? And I, I wasn't aware of anyone in your area that's reported back on them, so thank you. Yeah. So, and if anybody didn't catch that, she said the Gray County area, right? You're you're basically on um, Lake Huron or Lake or Georgian Bay or. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. <coughs> Thanks for the input. Yes, I'm glad to see that you're trying different things because I, I deal with the outskirts of the Golden Horseshoe and the GTA, so I look after the Owen Sound with the team. Uh, and we have tried pushing the envelope even in Ottawa with some things that are marginal, and we find they're doing well if they're protected, right? And I think that's the crucial thing. Ask what they're gonna do and, and be willing to try. So that's great. We're down to the wire here, so I'm going to cruise through the last couple quickly uh, with Ted. Um, drift series, we're pushing the numbers up on these because we are seeing them perform really well. Um, great for mass plantings, available in about 10 different colors. Um, we're, we're seeing good response in the landscapes on them. Um, if anybody has any other information on that, certainly let us know. I know there was a couple of years ago where we had two hard winters in a row where they did take a bit of a beating, but... You know, for a rose, if you get two winters where you're going to minus 30, for a rose to survive two winters in a row like that, that's pretty good, right? So drift roses, we've put we've put a fair bit of into production on those. Uh, and knockout series is kind of the same story. They're both star roses category or the old carnet pile um, series. And they're really, they've been around for a lot of years now. Um, but we are seeing that generally speaking, they're performing very well on their own with really no maintenance. And they, they are way out ahead of any of the other varieties in terms of just flower power uh, and again hardiness is certainly you know they're at the top of the range for roses uh, I'll give you one more here and that's um, I just want to hit so are we thinking of using um, potentially fruits in the landscape which are they dual up right they're multi-purpose um, We've been seeing a lot with blueberries where blueberries can make just a good strong bush with fantastic fall color because they get the nice oranges and reds. Uh, and at the same time, you can eat them. Um, and we had another slide in here, and I don't know where that, where that went to, but we also had grapes. Um, and, you know, grapes, grape vine, uh, super tough. No problem growing them if you got something that you need a vine on. And at the same time, they produce fruit. There we go. We're a little out of order here, but we wanted to squeeze that in. Uh, boxwood. Yes, we grow lots of them. We will not run out. Uh, so many different varieties out there. Uh, so you can pretty much cover anything you're looking for. Uh, great as an individual specimen, good in a hedge. Um, I like personally the green velvet. 
but I'm starting to like this one as well because it has a nice glossy, shiny leaf. Uh, it also, um, smaller. smaller leaf, which is good as well, right? Because not everybody likes that big leaf that you have to keep cutting back. Uh, strong green color all year, so you're not going to get the fade in the winter. Um, Amel anchors. We all have the canadensis, the native one. You see it out in the woods. It looks great. looks fantastic. Uh, the Granda Flora is a nice alternative to that because it does stay nice and tight. Uh, and again, like the blueberries, it's got the flower in the spring. It's got the berry. Uh, you can even eat the berry. Not as good as a blueberry. Um, keep it away from the house because the birds do like it and you know what they're going to drop all over your deck. Uh, fall color is fantastic. Next slide is, um, we're missing one here, but it's another variety of Amelanchier. It's more of a dwarf one. So again, you know, smaller yard. Uh, this here is another option to use if, if you want that effect, but without the large cumbersome plant that's in your backyard. Uh, great for pruning. And again, we like these because they help feed the wildlife, the birds, they love them. Absolutely love them. Uh, this one is a, a more, uniform growth than the canadensis uh, and tighter tighter plant cleaner plant um, the native one can tend to get a little unruly sometimes so I think everybody knows this one uh, Dowick purple probably the most sought after pyramidal tree out there um, it's, it, it, it's been really picked over the last few years. We do have them coming in. Uh, not a problem with that. Uh, but that's why we also introduced the other pyramidal trees, just to say there's other things out there, right? It's, it's not just this plant itself. Uh, I'm going to do this one yet, and then Rob will take over. Um, this is a new hosta. I like this hosta, and this comes from a guy that does not like hostas. Okay, I think there's too many of them. They're not for me. Um, but they are a fantastic plant because they, they will do whatever you want and you have such a variety to choose from that your customer can tell you this is what I want and you will find it in the hosta world. I have never seen so many new introductions. I like this one and I'm probably actually going to plant it because this is so many hostas rolled into one. Okay, so don't be afraid to explore the hosta world. We've kind of run out of time. We've got 10 slides here. We're just going to scroll through them uh, because we want to respect the schedule. Uh, we're just going to scroll through them. There's 10 varieties of perennials that are new this year that uh, Andy has asked us to show. I had some descriptions for the them. Slides because they're not in line for some yeah. reason. <laughs> yeah. but, but Ted will just scroll through those 10 so that you've got the whole mix. But these are 10 varieties that we can just kind of go through slowly here. And they're in the presentation, so you can ask for them later, um, that are really just up and coming and in production now. So they'll be available at some point through the course of the year that we are seeing some real special characteristics with. Um, and I'll leave it at that. We appreciate you being here once again. Uh, if you do have questions, I think we're having a short break after this. And so you can certainly come up and ask us uh, if there's additional. We're out of time, so I'm going to end it there. Thanks again. <laughs>